Good afternoon. Can everybody hear me? Uh, I think we, even without a microphone, everybody could hear me in here. Um, looks like the turnout is a little smaller than I expected um, with an exciting topic like that. Um, my name is Mike Kostersitz. I'm a senior architect in the Center of Excellence for Office 365 in Europe. I work in Microsoft Services. Um, been with Microsoft for almost 20 years. Uh, different roles, including in the product group in Redmond for seven years uh, as a program manager. Uh, one of my primary responsibilities is help, help large enterprise customers um, migrate to Office 365 from whatever they have on premises today. Um, this talk is about the questions we get around security, trust, and um, privacy in Office 365. Um, with some, some, a little bit of focus on SharePoint Online. Um, so he, quick show of hands, who in here is using Office 365 today? Ooh, good. So you're all migrated to the cloud 100%? No, uh, only one or two? Good. Um, anybody in here, lar a company larger than 50,000 seats? One, two, okay, three. Good. So there's something in there for everybody. Um, since it's a relatively small crowd, I almost was saying small cloud, it's a small crowd. Um, obviously, everybody else is re getting ready for uh, John Bon Jovi already. And um, if you have any questions, please raise a hand. I'll try to answer them while we go along. And um, let's get going. So since almost everybody in here know is already using Office 365 or, or has seen it, I'll just skip over this a little bit. But what is Office 365? It brings together um, the cloud versions or the online versions of, the, of, of four of our major products, Office Professional Plus, Exchange Online, SharePoint Online, and Link Online. The current active or released version is based on the 2010 versions of those products. Um, the next version, the preview that's out there is already um, up and running, and we're getting there to deliver this early next year. So, we deliver things like pay-as-you-go service, uh, per-user licensing, complete office experience with service integration, I am a presence in Link Online, large mailboxes, integrated personal archiving and exchange online, retention policies, SharePoint Online, of course, my sites to manage and share documents, document access offline, which is going to get a lot better, um, as you've seen in the keynote probably on Monday um, with uh, SkyDrive Pro document level permissions, and document sharing with extranet sites or as extranet sites using um, partner access in the enterprise licensing. So one of the biggest things that we hear every time when we start talking to a customer about moving to Office 365 is, can we trust it? Can I actually hand all my data over to cloud provider? doesn't matter if it's Microsoft, Google, somebody else. The questions usually are the same. Can we trust this company to throw all my corporate data at their data center and see if it, um, and I'm basically, is it private? Will they analyze it? How do I deal with loss of control? Um, how does this fit the regulatory um, requirements of my country? Since I'm in Europe, I'm dealing with 50, 52 different legis legislations in terms of cloud security privacy requirements. In the US, it's slightly simpler. There's one country, more or less the same regulations everywhere. In Europe, you have the European Union that gives some guidance and say, this is what it should look like. And then every country takes it, interprets it, and comes up with their own set of rules based on that, usually more stringent, sometimes a little bit looser, or completely different if they choose to, which is really fun. And it makes my job ultimately interesting because every day I see something new. Um, then questions around physical and logical security are definitely ones that we get a lot. It's like, where's my data, right? Um, how do I get my data back out of the service if I have to? Somebody leaves my company, how do I get the data back out? Things like that. So and I want to go through those um, over the next close to an hour, I think, and then talk about those four areas where we get most of the concerns from a customer's side. And that's privacy. What does privacy mean for Microsoft? Um, are you building some advertising product on top of that? Are you looking at my email data? Are you reading my SharePoint documents um, to determine what I kind of publish and so on and so forth? 
Then um, transparency, where do I have my data? Who has access to my data? Can anybody at Microsoft look at my data that's stored in Office 365? How is this restricted? How is it controlled? How is it audited? How do I figure out who has accessed my data as a customer? <clears throat> which leads to the security question, and then, which basically means inherently is cloud computing actually secure? Um, are Microsoft Online services secure? And that f feeds into the compliance discussion, of course. What certifications do you hold? How do you test those? What are the capabilities um, Microsoft has? Or how does Microsoft support customer compliance needs? So if something comes up in a country, we just had that happen in Germany, something comes up in Germany, in, in a county actually in Germany, you talk, they come up with this new rule, now you have to kind of struggle can we support that? How can we support it to make sure that customers that have already migrated in that county or will be migrating can actually fit those regulatory needs? What is the right that I have as a customer to look at the audit reports or actually audit Microsoft myself? <clears throat> All that information that's in that slide, in this slide deck and what I'm talking about is actually public information. Who knows the trust center? OK, so this is a good session for everybody. Um, if you want to know more about the stuff that I talk about, white papers around it, documentation around it, it's all on trust.office365.com. The talk here is merely a um, compression of the information that's out there. So the trust principles Microsoft uses to help secure data, um, make sure that it stays private, uh, is built on four pillars. One is around your privacy, which really matters to Microsoft, to, our, to us, because we respect it, and we ensure that nobody else can breach it. Uh, leadership and transparency. We talk about what we're doing. Where is your data? Who can access it? How is it accessed? How do you monitor who accesses your data? We let our data center, our processes, procedures, everything audit and verify independently by third parties. So we're following world um, industry standards that are out there. They're, they are verified on a regular basis. And then we'll talk about the certifications a little bit later. We are really re re uh, relentless in terms of security procedures and how this works, both from physical, logical security. And we make sure that these security policies are followed. They are transparent, which comes back to the second pillar. And we make sure that everybody understands what we're doing to keep your data secure. So let's dive a little bit deeper into privacy and why this really matters to both Microsoft and, of course, our customers. <clears throat> there's a couple of, there's two areas that really feed into um, a breach of privacy. One is the security side, where we talk about standard attack vectors like elevation of privilege, spoofing, tampering, denial of service attacks. On the other side are the controls that control and make sure that your privacy um, is actually um, honored, which is PI controls that are in place, notice and consent. For instance, when you open a service request, the service, request, the service engineer, obviously the support engineer, and it requires to access your data, the support engineer will, get your content, will notice, notify you of that and then actually get your consent to do that so that they are actually allowed to do that. If there would be a security breach, we didn't have one yet, um, there would be a, uh, there's a defined breach response. Data minimization, transnational data flows. So Microsoft has data centers around the world. Um, support is handled out of several regions to keep 24 seven support running. Um, it might be necessary that in terms of support, delivering support to you as a customer, we need to transfer some data maybe email because it comes in corrupted or SharePoint documents that get, um, get, get corrupted or something like that. So it might, have, might be necessary to transfer data between Europe and US, for instance, for investigative, investigative purposes. So it's really important that those things do not lead, that the breach of any of those does not lead to information disclosure for you as a customer. That's really, really important. So we do set a very, very high bar 
um, around the privacy practices and global standards that we do and then we, we follow for data handling and transfer. So we got, there's no advertising built on top of the customer data. No email is indexed, no documents are indexed um, to produce advertising products. Um, we do scan, of course, documents and emails for viruses and malware to ensure that the data is secure, but it's not used for any other purposes. Data portability, the data always belongs to you as a customer. In reality, we don't really care what's stored in Office 365. It's your data, right? As long as it doesn't breach the SLA, oh, sorry, the, the, the service agreement, um, you can export your data at any time. Sometimes it's a little bit more complex, sometimes it's a little bit easier, but in reality, you can always grab your data and go if you really want to. We also keep the data separate from the consumer services. So what used to be Hotmail or SkyDrive and SkyDrive Pro are completely different um, service server environments, completely different network environments. They might live in the same data center, but it's different areas completely separate from each other. So this is a, a lot of stuff, and I'm not going to go through every line of this, but and the information is out on the trust center. And this is basically the matrix where data is stored, how data is used, and for what it is used, and who can access the data. Um, for instance, for advertising, usage data, account and address book data, customer data, excluding core customer data, and the core customer data, which is the content of your documents, are never used for that. Voluntary disclosure to law enforcement? No way. If, if law enforcement comes to our door and says, I need customer access data, we'll tell, tell them, go there. It's customer access data. Go talk to customer X. Right? That's our first response to a request like that. <clears throat> Security, spam, and malware pre prevention? We do scan your usage data. We use the account and address book data to ensure that an email that gets delivered to your company is actually to a valid recipient, right? So we need to look at your address book data. We look at the, for, for spam and malware, we actually scan the email, obviously, or we, we scan a document that gets uploaded into SharePoint Online. <clears throat> for example, when you look at who can access your data when, the operations response team has limited access to all the data but only to your core customer data, which is the content of email, the content of documents, is only by exception. And there's three people needed. Come to your question in a second. That you need the consent of three people inside of support to actually get to that server, physically or logically through a terminal server session. Question back there. So if I, if I heard the question correctly, it was, the, it was around how do we um, store the customer data um, for one customer and then for the other. So that depends a little bit on the service. So for Exchange Online, for example, customer mailboxes are spread across mailbox servers in one data center unit or, or one scale unit if you want to speak. To, it's like 500 servers in a scale unit and you've got 500 users. Every user might be on a different server in that scale unit. And then another customer will have in the same scale unit his other 500 mailboxes. But through permissions, those are isolated from each other. So one customer cannot access another customer's mailbox. SharePoint Online, it looks a little bit, more di a little bit different. Every customer gets their own instance, so to speak, inside a SharePoint farm where they, can, where they have an isolated, um, uh, isolated area in there in terms of storage, in terms of front end. Um, uh, processing power, right? Link online, there is no, there is separation in terms of address book data, but there's no separation in terms of um, video audio services. Everybody uses the same pool, basically. So there's a little bit different depending on the service you're talking about. Does that answer the question? Okay, perfect. I'm always afraid I'm overlooking somebody behind the speaker there. So if I, don't, if I do, please shout out. So as a customer, we want to make sure that you understand where is your data, who can access it, and what we do with the data. And that's really important, um, especially if you are a multinational customer, 
to understand where the data is stored and what the geographic boundaries are. We determine the location of the tenant or the region where the tenant is going to be created based on your ship to address. So if your company is in the US and you specify a United States address, you will end up in a US data center. Which one? You'll have to, it's, it's anybody's guess, but you can look it up once you create it. Um, if you're in EMEA or in Europe, also in, in South Africa, for example, you will get created in either Dublin or in Amsterdam, or actually in both data centers. If you have Exchange Online, you will span both data centers. SharePoint is an active passive model where there's one data center will host your prime, it's going to be the active SharePoint farm, and then there's a backup farm should the one die in the other data center. So important if you're multinational or multi-regional to determine where are the most users you have. So if you have users in the US, Europe, and in Asia, and you have 10,000 in the US, 1,000 in Europe, it might make more sense to stick your tenant into the US data center. If it's the other way around, it might more, more, be more, make more sense to stick your most users into European data centers and have the smaller populations access the European data center. We do not support spanning regions with one data center at the moment. Is anybody out there that has a need for that? Very few do, so that's, that's why we decided this is not the functionality that we absolutely need. So core customer data is only accessed for troubleshooting and malware prevention purposes. This is really important. I can't re-emphasize that um, enough. The, the access to that data is limited to key personnel on a per exception basis. There's a very strict protocol how you can get to that data, and it's really important. So either the customer mails it to the support engineer. So that basically is an implicit consent. Here is my data. Please have a look at that email, why it's corrupted. Or um, if there is an operational need, the customer will be informed. We will get the consent, and then somebody will go and access that data to determine some fault if needed. If there is a data center location change, for example, we build a third, we, hypothetically, we build another data center in Europe. It would mean basically that all the customers will get notified, hey, there's now a third data center location. Don't be surprised that your mailboxes now show up in three different uh, locations in Europe instead of two. So there will be a notification, which makes it really important when you set up your tenant that the technical contact on that tenant is a valid email address. If you are not a single person, maybe a distribution list or a SharePoint um, list that you can email enable SharePoint list or public folder, whatever you want to use for that, but some, some, some place where people read the emails that come in there. Otherwise, you miss those notifications. So when we talk about security, there's a whole process and a whole life cycle behind it where we make sure that we can reduce vulnerabilities and limit, ex and limit the, explo the exploit severity when we should we incur a security issue? And it starts with educating everybody, um, the developers, the testers, the administrators, with um, security training that's refreshed on a regular basis to make sure that everybody understands what the processes, the policies, and the approaches to making sure that the products are developed secure, deployed secure, and operated secure. That's really, really important. Um, when we have the process that basically goes from the design, the implementation, to the verification of a product or even a feature inside the product, we go through a lot of different stages. So when you look at the design stage here, um, it's really important to, dis uh, to establish design requirements and analyze this on the attack surface. And then also the threat modeling behind it happens already at the design stage. So this is when the first security review happens. Um, if that's not successful, the product never goes into the implementation phase, or the feature doesn't go into the impl implementation phase, but the PMs and the developer uh, leads have to go back and review their design because they couldn't mitigate all the threats. In the implementation, of course, you can't, well, you can, but we shouldn't, and it's very clear in the process, you should not use non-standard developer tools. Just use the Microsoft-approved developer tools to make sure that um, code that you write is always um, checked before check-in and make sure that it's all um, written in a safe manner. Um, 
deprecate unsafe functions. So previously, in the early days, like the 90s, it was very common that we used unsupported or undocumented APIs. We get away from that a lot. And then basically, the goal is to get away 100% from that. So we make sure that those are not used anymore. And there's a lot of static analysis in, in the development phase and also in the implementation phase of, other, of operational procedures. And then there's a verification once the code's complete, where we go through dynamic analysis, fuzz testing, um, another attack surface review. And because, because of that, once the product, the code is complete, we can actually go into the final security review in the account on, on, on the release side, where we can make sure, sure that before the product or the feature gets implemented in the service, it's already reviewed a lot, it has been tested very well, and it's, it's very clear that there's, there's a low chance that there's a vulnerability in there. <clears throat> and then at the, at the end of the life cycle, when you look at that, there is an incident response plan that needs to be developed alongside the feature or the, the service, uh, the, the, the product. And then if something happens, this incident response plan comes into play and gets executed on by the um, security response uh, team. And this is, of course, is important. It's a life cycle. So once it's done, we start all over again. And the process basically refines itself through all the release cycles that we're going through. Um, if you look at the Office 365 service, every two to three months, there's a new, there's a service release that goes out. It's not like we release it and then it's like three years nothing. So every two to three months, we ship new functionality, we fix things, we improve on the service, and that is an ongoing cycle. So the, the teams have to go through that on a constant basis. So if you look at an example of the uh, security pro the progress that we made in terms of developing that, um, that life cycle. In the early days when we did Office XP, um, we had macro security levels, which only caught about 9% of the malware that was and all the security issues that were reported, right? It's about 9%. When we switched to Office 2003, we started supporting more secure functionality like crypto API trusted publishers, ActiveX control security was implemented at that point in time, which reduced the vulnerabilities that were detected once the product shipped um, by about 30. When we went to Office 2007, the first thing we did is we implemented default settings that were more secure than in 2003. We reduced the security prompts, of course, there was a lot of stuff around trusted locations to make sure that only signed macros can run and other things. And also when file format uh, issues happened, we blocked those instead of running those. And that reduced it by about 50, the amount of security issues that were reported on day one. Office 2010 implemented a lot, another level of security features. And now we only, when we shipped on day one, we only had about nine reported security issues within the first couple of months. So as you can see, the process had its effect and it refined itself over the release time of about, well, it was about 15 years, 10 years, 12 years, something like that. But it dropped basically very rapidly to the bottom. Office 2013, which is not on there, which just shipped, is actually at zero, which is the goal that we wanted to achieve. We will see how long that holds, though. Somebody will find something. One of the core security improvements we did in Office was file fuzzing. File fuzzing means that we take a file, an Office document, and we modify it on a binary level, a bit here, a bit there. And we see what it, what, what it does to the product and when it fails. We, do that, we don't do that with one file. We do it with a million different files. Micro, as you can imagine, Microsoft internally has a couple of million Office documents. So we have a, lot, a large pool to choose from, so to speak, with macros in it, with VBA code in it, with different things in it, forms, all those things. So we can actually try a lot of stuff out. There's a lot of iterations that go through that. But it also leads to fixing a lot of bugs. In the case of Office 2010, it was over, over 900 bugs that were found um, just because of that improvement of, of that feature. Another thing that really came out of this approach of file fuzzing is building an XST for a binary file format to allow quickly scan for potential problems on that file, which Go, happens dynamic, when, dynamically when you load a file, which is very interesting. And then basically, that reduces 
the amount of vulnerabilities in Office to basically zero in 2013. So what does that mean to service security? Service security is a, we, we see service security as, a defense, as, as an approach for defense in depth, where we go with a multidimensional approach uh, to make sure that your data and the service is safe. And that starts really on top at the security management, where we make sure that we understand what kind of threats does the service have, how do potential vulnerabilities look like, how do we monitor for those, and how do we respond to those. Respond to those. Then for the data layer, we're looking at access control monitoring and file and data integrity. This is basically where um, malware scanning comes in, virus scanning comes in, ensuring that files have a valid format that you upload into SharePoint. We don't allow to upload, for example, um, executable files into SharePoint, which makes sense, I guess. Um, on the user side, we make sure that the accounts are managed well that we have training and awareness and also a screening process in place to ensure that all people that can access the data center or the data are instructed, are trained, and also are, are safe, quote, to basically access that data if they have to. On the application side, we apply the secure development process, SDL, and we have a lot of access control and monitoring and also anti-malware scanning on the application side to make sure that data that comes in through the application level is um, secure and doesn't disturb the service. So if one customer uploads a bad file, it can't bring down the service for everybody else. We need to make sure that that happens. On the host side, on the physical machine side, it's really important for access control so that nobody can go into the server, pull a hard drive, and walk out with it. Um, monitoring of the hardware, of course. Make sure that the service is always running. Have, have respective, um, it's not a single point of failure on the host. Anti-malware patch and configuration management is really important when we look at that to make sure that the service keeps running. If there's a vulnerability detected, we need to make sure we plug that hole really quick and we can update all the hosts um, in the data center. On, in, a, in a secure manner. Internal network. If support needs to access customer core data or customer uh, data, we need to make sure that there's dual factor authentication in place, either through biometrics or smart card. There's intrusion detection in place, vulnerability scanning in place. So we make sure that when somebody accesses the network, that's recorded, it's auditable. So there's not a single administrator account, obviously, for all of Office 365, for example. At the network perimeter, we ensure that our edge routers have intrusion detection, um, also vulnerability scanning. If somebody kind of tries a port scan or denial of service text, those are caught there. And then last but not least, there's the facility control, the physical access to make sure that you can't walk into the data center, take a rack, and wheel it out of there. Um, which, which was tried before. Um, there's video surveillance all over, over the place, access control with uh, fingerprint and handprint scanners. Um, some data center areas, for, for example, the government site where the, um, in the US data centers where the government Office 365 versions hosted, they have additional biometric controls. And this is a special area in the data center, so there's a bigger data center inside the data center, where there's additional security protocols in place so that you know that even less people can access that, and it's even harder to get there than to the normal service, under quote unquote. So, for example, a um, sample facility uh, that's 24 by 7 guarded, so it's not kind of we close the door at 6 p.m. and everybody walks out. Probably not. Average data center size is about 700,000 square foot. Uh, there's tens of thousands of servers in there that run Office 365, and then there's a couple of, under, couple of other tens of thousands of servers that run Azure, Hotmail, and all the other services that we host in a data center. Also, backup power is available for all the data centers, obviously, so we have a couple of days of backup power should something happen. Sometimes even that doesn't help. If the power grid dies, where the generators are connected, you can't even start the generator. Um, luckily, that only does happen very rarely. And then there's another data center where we can fall 
fail over to, to actually mitigate that risk. Excuse me? So the question is, how long does a failover take? Um, it depends on the part of the service. Exchange Online, I think, has a eight-hour maximum, but it's usually two hours for Exchange Online. It's all in the service description for the service. Uh, there's in every service description, there's at the end, there's a list of the time to recovery, time to failover, and then that's all listed in there. It's part of the SLA. <clears throat> Um, which brings me right into the um, Office 365 part of the SLA, the comprehensive protection. So we are doing a multi-layer protection against spam and malware. For Exchange, we have forefront of online protection for Exchange. And then in Exchange Online, we use um, forefront for Exchange to scan again. Um, effectiveness is guaranteed by financially backed SLAs. So if we miss our SLA, customers that were impacted by that, in, you know, by that event, get their money back. Um, there's in-product controls to make sure that users are protected from threats. So if somebody downloads a virus from the web and tries to upload it into SharePoint, we ensure that not all documents um, get infected by that or a user cannot download an infected document. Send an attachment that's infected or malware, we will block that so that users are protected from that. We do have policy rules that inspect emails in transit, for example. We do allow integration with Active Directory Rights Management Service to um, allow customers to enforce encryption at rest in the data center. Um, we do enforce end-to-end -end encrypted communication. So every data that's transferred between customer on-site or customer client and the cloud service is always either over SSL or TLS protected in the case of SMTP traffic. Uh, <coughs> excuse me. And for visibility and control, we allow the customer to look at the uh, reporting and auditing that the product offers. And so if, if in Exchange Online, for example, there's a report that's called non-owner uh, non access, non-owner mailbox access. You can run that report, and it will give you a detailed list when an administrator has accessed somebody else's mailbox. So if your CEO comes to you, says, I have the feeling somebody read my email, you can just run that report and ensure and look up if, the, if somebody has access to the CEO's email without his consent. Um, there's granular control over user access and permissions, so you can prevent some of that by reducing the number of full admins in the service, and you can basically, like you do on-premises, on your enterprise administrator account is probably locked away somewhere um, in a safe, and nobody knows the password, and then the number of domain admins are hopefully less than five, who has more than five domain admins in an on-premise environment? Good, good security practices. Um, granular control over user access and permissions is really important to, in to enforce your own security policies on top of what Microsoft does to enforce those. Um, for mobile device access, we allow you to enforce security policies and also allow for remote device wipe. Um, it's not really a SharePoint Online specific site, it's more an email site, but in general, if user uses their device with all their company email on it, you might wanna have uh, a way to wipe that device at the end. <clears throat> a very common security concern around that is that when you upload or you send data, you store data at the Microsoft Data Center, it is stored, not stored at rest, or not encrypted at rest, so it's encrypted in transit, but it's not encrypted at rest. For very sensitive data, customer can choose to implement Active Directory Rights Management Services, um, ADRMS, to store the data encrypted at rest. For sen sensitive external sent and received email um, or documents that get sent around, um, you will have to find a different impl uh, implement a different encryption strategy. For email, it would be SMIME, for example. The thing is, when you store data encrypted at rest, it has some impact on the service because once it's encrypted, you can't full text index it anymore, right? ADRMS writes protected documents, store it in SharePoint. It's just a blob. We can't index it anymore. Um, and you also have identity and key management issues between on-premises and the cloud. If you would like Microsoft to in index your document that's encrypted in SharePoint online, uh, you would have to hand us the key to the document, which kind of defeats the purpose of encrypting it probably in the first place. 
So the customer has to make a decision, do I want the full functionality or do I want to kind of, you have to find the, the way to do, divide that, but it's a customer decision how to implement that. So everybody can, any host, any, any cloud provider can tell you, here's all the stuff we do, but how do you verify that what the cloud provider says actually makes sense and also has um, some meaning behind it? So one thing we do is we um, have the industry standards that we follow verified by third parties. So it's really important that um, to understand that we're not permitting customers to go into our data center or send an auditing company to our data center to audit Microsoft. But we do use third party companies to audit our procedures, the data center, the security uh, processes we put in place, the measures, everything that we put in place are audited by third parties and we'll be happy to hand over those reports to our customers. But imagine, imagine 3.5 million customers walking in, around our data center auditing Microsoft is probably not something I as a customer would want. But we do provide the transparency and we allow um, customers to view those reports. They're, public, they're made available once you subscribe to the service or before you subscribe to the service, we can hand over those reports. Is there anybody in here already asked for those? No? So you're all happy with the way it works? No? That's not good. <laughs> I think I'm putting you to sleep with this exciting topic. Yes, question? Okay. Okay, so the question is how do we make sure that the third parties we hire to make those audits are independent? And so, by the way, so when you choose an auditing company, um, I can't think of. Right, so, so you, yeah, you pick an auditing company um, based, on their, based on their reputation, right? So, if you put, take a tax auditor, they have to come from the IRS. You have to trust them to do the right thing. For, well, they're, they're not a good example, I think. <laughs> I wouldn't choose them for a data center audit. But, but in general, what we do is we choose a third party that has, an, has, a, has a reputation to do the right thing. And we're not paying them to, to fake a report. We're paying them to do an independent audit. So that's really important. And customers can trust that. And we're using different ones, so you can choose which one you want to trust or not. Question back there? So the question was, would it be the same concept like a financial institution hiring some audit company to, to manage, to, to review their processes and procedures? Yes, it's basically the same thing. Different set of standards, probably, right? And let me get to that really quick, um, right after this. So our compliance management framework builds on, um, when you look from top down, there's a policy that guides the, the rules for protecting your information and the systems which store and process information. There's a control framework below that, which ensures that the, pro the policies are implemented and followed. And then there is a system or procedural specific requirements that must, must be met on the standard side, which is your ISO certification, the HIPAA certification, EU model clauses, whatever you want to take there. And then there's operating procedures, which is the physical implementation of the, of the policy and those standards. So when we look at <clears throat> the compliance, here's a few of them. The, the full list is on the Trust Center website. Um, so we have the ISO 27001 certifications, one of the best security benchmarks available. Um, Office 365 was the first um, business productivity cloud service that implements that, control, those controls on physical, logical process and management of a cloud service. For European customers, really important, the EU model clauses, because they give, you the frame, give European customers the framework to use a cloud service. 
all countries in the European Union follow those model clauses and those requirements in there and build their own privacy and security requirements based on those. The data processing agreement is also very, very important because it governs what, um, how data is handled between the customer, Microsoft, and our data center. And it goes beyond what the EU model clauses define. If, if most countries in the EU and also outside of the EU actually require, in Europe at least, require data processing agreement between the cloud provider and, and the customer. On the US side, we, we do support HIPAA, for example, the Health Insurance Portability and Accountability Act, which governs basically how um, health information is stored. Um, we're also offering to sign the business associate agreement for HIPAA, um, required cust customers that require HIPAA. Um, one thing to keep in mind, though, is that Office 365 is not designed to store HIPAA information or, or health information. So if you do store health information, because it's not encrypted at rest by default, you'll have to implement that layer. We do support EU safe harbor, which basically prohibits personal data from crossing borders into other countries, um, except under um, certain reasons that are governed by the data processing and the safe harbor agreements. So, yes, so the question was, there might be reasons to transfer data across boundaries um, in terms of the EU safe harbor. Yes, there might be, especially if you're, if you're having a support incident in the middle of the night and your support request might be transferred to the U.S. or to Asia, depending on where it falls time-wise. So if you open a support request and it requires data to be transferred, then yes, that might be part of that, right? But only in form... In, in, it will only happen due to, opera due to operational needs, not because we're, f we're failing over from Europe to the US or to Asia or something like that. We're not replicating data on a regular basis to there. It's really in operational needs, okay? <clears throat> For example, login data, if, if, if the, live, the org ID service in Europe breaks, breaks, we will fall back to the US org ID to enable login, right? Um, if forefront online protection in Europe is not reachable because of a, some, some internet traffic issue, we will, email will be ingested in the US first, right? So all the FOPI traffic will go to the US and then through the internal network back to Europe to the mailbox. So there's a couple of cases where this can happen and sometimes it has already happened and was operationally necessary to keep the service running to do that. But it will not take your mailbox and move it to China or to Singapore or something like that or the US. <clears throat> so here's a list of um, the certifications, and the, the list is actually longer in the meantime. After I did the slide about six weeks ago, um, the list got a little bit longer. There's a little bit additional stuff there, and it's already on the Trust Center website. Important is that the ISO certification applies to everybody. It's available. Um, EU Safe Harbor applies, obviously, to European customers or EU customers. Um, SSA is 16, primarily to US customers, though I had a Russian customer requiring that um, a couple of months ago. So there is a couple of um, non-US customers that are asking for that. FISMA is the US government um, certification. HIPAA and BEA, we already talked about, model clauses and the data processing agreement for EU customers too. <clears throat> So there was an update to the HIPAA compliance, um, or basically the business uh, associate agreement. And this is basically where we have made very clear that Office 365 is not intended to be used as a PHI response repository. Customers should make their own decisions um, on how to best comply with HIPAA. More information for that will be, is, is available by, I think, last week on uh, the Trust Center now. So let me give you a quick overview of the Trust Center website, since very few people have raised their hands. So when you look at the Trust Center website, it's basically trust.office365.com. It redirects you to this website, and it gives you um, 
all of the four pillars we talked about, um, why the privacy matters. Um, here is the details on the data use limit, the table we talked about, uh, the, the matrix with the description. Um, there's a privacy white paper, which you can read through in, in great detail about how we implement the controls to ensure that your privacy is protected. <clears throat> On the leadership and transparency, you'll see the ge geographic boundaries. Um, that's the Americas. If you look at the boundary information, you'll have to log into the portal of your tenant. Luckily, the internet is working for a change. So here is, you now get an act, you then get access to um, a PDF file. And I'm not sure if there's read around, oh, okay. So here is the customer data flows for North America, described in great detail. Uh, desktop. So you can go back to that. And then there's also white papers on the data center efficiency and then how the servers are run, how third parties get access, and how administrative access is governed inside the Microsoft Online Services. <clears throat> there's a special section for SharePoint Online. So if you want to have admin access data, you'll have to go and file a support request. And then you get a report for the last 90 days, 180 days, whatever's required of administrative access to the SharePoint online data in your uh, tenant. When we look at the independently verified, here's a list of the uh, certifications. And if you click that link, it takes you basically to the site where you can sign up for that certification, where you basically can sign the contractual agreement. And here is the details on the security audits and certifications for the different services. So there's Office 365, there's others for Dynamics, and then there is combined ones that uh, apply to all both services. Here's all the details, what is certified, how it's certified, and how you can get to the reports when, if you require those. But what is really interesting to, to, to read through is the compliance framework. That's a very detailed description of the pyramid that I showed you. Um, it basically describes those, every single layer in that pyramid in very, very great detail and, and how to verify what's happening there. And then there's the security piece we talked about. There's a nice video about the data center, uh, how the data center security is implemented, at least the stuff we want to tell you. Um, we can't, obviously, you can't reveal every single security measure um, that, that's implemented. Any questions to the trust center? Good. Yeah, let's get. Sorry. Oh, can I talk a little bit about RMS? Just in general. So RMS rights management system allows you to set permissions on a document. What can happen with a document? Can I forward it? Can I reply to it? And then at the same time, it also encrypts the document. So when you store it, it ends up encrypted in the, in the SharePoint site. The downside to that is, of course, that you have to implement it on-premises in the current version of Office 365. You'll have to run ADRMS on-prem um, so that your users can actually make use of that. Um, and then uh, you'll have to share the keys with your The users can access them through Active Directory directly, but if you want to share them with external parties, you'll have to share the keys with them so they can actually decrypt the document. So it's a, it's a, it's a very um, efficient way to do it, but it's an additional administrative burden because it has to be, of course, no single point of failure. You want to have more than one ADRMS server. You have to manage all the keys, all the certificates for that. So there's a lot of management overhead to do it, but it's definitely doable. I'm working with a customer in the UK. They have about 80,000 seats. Um, they have deployed our ADRMS to everybody, um, including off the users that are in Office 365. They're about two thirds in Office 365, one third on prem. They're running 24 RMS servers globally to actually support the system. Um, so 
it, it's, a, it's a broad topic to talk about RMS, but it, it's an, you have to be aware that it's not kind of a set up one server and that's it. It's a lot of ad administrative overhead, so you need to be very sure it's the right thing and you need exactly that. Excuse me? Um, the trust center content, the question was, is the trust center content available in other languages? That is an excellent question, and I think it is. Let's jump over here and check. Um, German, for example, is the only other language I really understand. Uh, if I could find it. No, it's not, it's not available in German. Um, it's available in Italian. Oh, there it is. I was looking for Austria. <laughs> so here it is in German. So it, it is available in all these languages. Um, some of the white papers might not be translated. They be, um, I guess, I'm guessing most of the white papers and videos will stick in English, but the general page is at least translated. So. Yes? If you, uh, so the question was, there was a document you had to log in for to actually get that if you don't have Office 365. So the simplest way is either ask your Microsoft representative to provide you with it, or the other way to do it is sign up for a trial account. You don't have to have a paid account for that. So that would be the simplest way. But if you have a Microsoft sales and account manager or a TAM, if you have a premier contract, just ask them for it. <clears throat> So this is the screens. Um, I took screenshots how to sign up for the EU model clauses. The reason, because I already signed up with my tenant for them. Um, but when you go, I showed you the link on the, on the trust center. You click on here. It takes you down to the, um, the screen. You log into the portal. You check up where, which one you want to have, the model clauses, data processing agreement, the HIPAA, BAA. You sign it. You type in your name, first and last name. Click on accept, and that's it. And then in the end, so you sign into your online portal. Here is where you select which contract you want to sign up for. <coughs> and when you click accept, that moves up into the accepted contractual supplements. And then you can actually also request a printed copy of that from, from the same part. So um, if you want to see additional stuff about that, uh, additional information about the trust um, information I just provided, there's a lot of information on the trust center as you've seen. And there's also the Global Foundation Services website. Global Foundation Services is our network provider. That's the Microsoft internal network and data center organization that runs the data centers, uh, that runs our complete global network. There's, very, there's a lot of information about the underlying security in the network. Um, and in the um, data centers in there. There's also a lot of videos about different data center architectures that we have deployed globally. It's a very interesting site to spend a couple of hours on. Um, it's like YouTube. You find new stuff every day when you go around there. Uh, it's a very interesting website. Um, there's an Office 365 Tech Center on TechNet, which gives a lot of information about the technical aspects, and of course, an Office Client Tech, tech Center on TechNet about the Office client. And that basically is the last slide in the presentation. I went a little bit faster than I expected, but so we have a little bit more time for, for question and answer. Um, if you have any specific questions for projects that you're running in, um, please could you walk up to the mic, or I'll just walk down here if you're loud enough. Okay, so the question was, I said, was about HIPAA certification. I said we were certified for HIPAA, but it's, the service is not designed for, to, to fulfill all the HIPAA requirements by default. So the, one, is, one of the HIPAA requirements is to store patient data in an encrypted format. So if you want to store HIPAA patient information in SharePoint Online, like x-ray photos, 
um, your medical history or whatever, you'll have to make sure that you store that as a customer, you'll have to fulfill that encryption requirement. The service itself does not do that by default. Okay, so the question is, when you sign up for the EU model clauses, the data processing agreement, et cetera, does this change the feature set of the product? No, it does not. So the certifications are the same, the feature set is the same. The only thing is that we both agree that we are following those guidelines, right? So the EU model clauses, the data processing agreement, the HIPAA agreement say, if you have patient information you want to store in SharePoint Online, you need to make sure to encrypt that. That's part of that agreement. It's just a legal agreement. We, will, we still support the same feature set. We still support the same certifications. But now it's basically legally binding between us. And that's very important, for example, in Europe. It doesn't matter if we, we agree to it. You can, you can sign the EU model clauses. We will still fulfill the requirements either way. Right? It's just that there's the legal requirement that you say, yes, there's a contract that says we do. OK, make sense? So the question is, you're, you're from the Netherlands, the question is, does through the Patriot Act, the, gov the US government, in theory, get access to the Microsoft data center. The theory says yes, they could. The EU safe harbor agreement says they cannot. Um, so there is a conflict. And if the EU government now comes as company X from the Netherlands is hosting data for a terrorist organization, we need that information. We will pass that on to the Netherlands government and say, hey, customer X, have we have a um, legal requirement to present the data? Do you present the data? Do you, do you not consent to that? And then you can make the decision. And if you don't, the FBI, NSA, or whoever will go to the Netherlands government and send your Netherlands government down to your, your, own, your Netherlands version of the FBI to the Microsoft data center to grab your data. Worst case scenario, right? Um, in general, every country has some sort of government agency that can access your data, no matter where your data center is, right? If you have your own data center in the Netherlands and the FBI comes to the Netherlands government and says, those are terrorists, I want their data, the Netherlands government will comply, right? The most likely. Okay? Anything else? Please do not forget to fill in the um, emails. Um, there's nice prices I've heard. I can't play, unfortunately, no matter how many f uh, sessions I visit. But do, because you can win a prize. There's another question down there. So the question was, is there, a, is there a way to have some hybrid environment between on-premise exchange and the cloud exchange? Absolutely. Absolutely. There's some technical requirements to do so, but in, in, in general, yes. Complete interaction between your on-premise exchange and the cloud is possible. Anything else? I know we are, everybody's tired. Thank you very much. <laughs> give you back 14 minutes of your day. <laughs>